a, this is the business that Kenley and I spent most of our time working on. Let me tell you, it's nothing like Amazon and so on. Well, it's really even silly to talk about them and say. But what I will say about this is we know what market we want to own. We started, we launched this eight weeks ago. We know what market. We want to own the over 50s high discretionary income market. We want to own them. Amazon can own the market as a whole. They can own online shopping as a whole. We don't want to be known as an online shopping portal. Along with this site, which is an online community, it all targets people over the age. We want to be known as a community where people over 50 can go, can use the technology that can feel safe to buy, safe to talk, safe to communicate, safe to share their ideas, safe to spend money. We want to own that over 50s market, in particular the over 50s high discretionary income market. Right now I can go on at length about the reasons for that, they're not really relevant to this. But what is relevant is this is a tiny business that's already setting about the process of owning a market. I'm not going to take Amazon on in the X and Y gene. Just not going to happen because I'm not going to win. Not in a fit am I going to win. But I can win by going after the over 50s. I can win by going after the over 50s high discretionary spend market. Because they, like most marketers on the planet, ignore people over 50. Go home and watch television tonight. Whatever you do, don't go home and watch television tonight. <laughs> but anyway, go home and watch television tonight. And if you can put yourself through it, turn to commercial television. And see how many advertisements you see targeting people over 50. If you see an Apier ad, that'll be the only product ad that's targeting people over 50. The only one. And yet it's the fastest growing demographic on the planet. It's the richest demographic on the planet. It's the most educated demographic on the planet. It is the most go out at night generation ever. It is an ideal market. It's a wonderful market. And yet it's been absolutely ignored. So what did we say? This is a market we're going to own. And we've got to do everything we can to try and you know. But at least when Mark Cuban rings me and asks how much money I want, I can tell him, this is the market we want to own, Mark. <coughs> so the first point is, create a brand that is know what you want people to say about you when you're not in the room. And own a market. Relate that brand to a market and own it. And make that market as small as you can afford to make it. Because the smaller you can afford to make it, the better you'll be able to table your product or service to meet its needs and requirements. The bigger it is, the harder it is to please. Yeah. Now when I say as small you can afford, when it gets so small it doesn't generate enough business to sustain your business. But you've got to find that happy medium. Find a market that's small enough for you to really understand, get in its head and know what it's all about. So to point two, Please stop me to ask questions. And if anybody falls asleep, I'll be very honest. Never. Um, offer a great product with a competitive advantage. Does anybody know who that guy is? His name's Michael Porter. Well, Professor Michael Porter. He is Professor of Strategy at Harvard. He is considered to be the world's preeminent strategist. Uh, this guy is uh, amazing, enormous intellect. Great stuff to read, and if you ever see any of his lectures on television, on YouTube, go to YouTube, type in Harvard Business School, and he'll come up. Listen to some of his lectures. This guy is good. This guy brings marketing into science, or the science into marketing. But he is responsible for the phrase strategic competitive advantage. And a strategic competitive advantage is essentially this: it's a point of difference that is tangible, sustainable targeted, relevant, distinctive, and able to be communicated. Now, I often say to people, what is your strategic, I'm going to stand over this side for a minute, what is your strategic competitive advantage in that side? We offer better service than anybody. That's not very tangible. What is service? Define service. Our products are better quality than anybody. Define quality. What's quality? What is quality? 
You know, we're more professional than anybody else. What is professional? What is professional? A strategic competitive advantage needs to be tangible. I need to better put my hand on it. I need to better say, we are three inches longer. We are four feet taller. We are three hours faster. We deliver in 20 minutes. We deliver in an hour. Whatever it is, it's got to be tangible. It's got to be real. 25% more of our graduates get jobs than anybody else. It's got to be something which I can put my hands on. Otherwise, you don't believe it anyway. If you see a commercial on TV and it says to you, you know, our products are the best in the world, do you believe it? No. Of course you don't believe it. But if they say, we deliver in an hour, you think, well, I must do it. It's covered by consumer law. You know, there's a good chance they will deliver within an hour. That's a tangible, real thing. My number one my number one lesson about advertising today, something I try to stay away from, but <laughs> is this. Don't bullshit. Don't waffle. Don't use platitudes. Get down to hardcore facts. Just tell people the truth. We deliver in an hour. <laughs> not we are faster than everybody else in the market. We deliver in an hour. Let them make the next jump. It's got to be sustainable. So if you say we are faster, you're only faster until somebody else is faster than you. It's not sustainable. If you say you deliver an hour, it's only sustainable if you can deliver an hour, no matter how big you grow. Whatever it is, it must be sustainable, because a competitive advantage can't be this today and that tomorrow. It needs to be the same thing for two, three, four, five years. It's got to be that one thing that you can carry through with you over a long period of time to convince people that they should buy this, and not this. So I hold up the iPhone in this hand and the Samsung in this phone. Why will you buy this and not this? You know, I used to do a lot of consulting. I used to say to clients, um, you know, somebody who sells chairs, furniture. I'll talk about furniture a bit later on. You know, why should I buy your chair and not your chair? That's what it gets down to. Now people think it's, it's, it's a lot more complicated. It's not a lot more. Why should I use that function center instead of that function center? That's what a competitive advantage is all about. And it's got to be sustainable. It can't be something different today than it is tomorrow. Third, it needs to be targeted. You can't make it tangible or, or sustainable unless it's targeted. You need to know exactly who you're targeting this competitive advantage at. Because if you tell me it's faster, I say, I don't care about speed. I've got all the time to work. If you tell me it's bigger, and I, I like things that are infinite. <laughs> you know, um, I'll talk about IKEA in a minute. There is nothing, nothing, nothing you can do to get me to an IKEA store. I've been in one once. It is the worst experience of my life. It is a disgusting experience. Now, they can tell me that their designs are sensational, that their service is sensational. They can tell me what they like. And I will not ever, ever go into an IKEA store nor park in their car. But what disgusted you about it? It's just a hideous experience for me. I hate it. Everything about it. I hate the product, I hate the store, I hate the car parks, the whole lot. Okay? Mm. But if I went and said that to the Swedish guy, his name is Casey, who owns IKEA, he'd say, tough, I don't care. I don't need your business. Well, he's, no, you say, you're not my target market. Yeah. You're not the guy I'm targeting. The guy I'm targeting loves what we do. And when I did some work for IKEA, I said to people, what do you like most about IKEA? You know what they said? The meatballs. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm a vegetarian. <laughs> you know, the meatballs. They like the meatballs. But so what I IKEA mean. know is that their market loves meatballs. Yeah. If they try to get me in with meatballs, they wouldn't get me in. They want to get somebody who likes meatballs in, they come and eat the meatballs. Apparently they're good. <laughs> um, it's got to be relevant. And that sort of fits in with Target. There's no point in having competitive values, it doesn't mean anything to me. It's got to be something I'm looking at. It's a function room. It's got to be, you know, it's, it's got a great view. But hang on, we don't look out the window. You know, it's got to be something that people really want. Not just something which is different for being different, say. Distinctive. Sets it apart. There's no point in having competitive values which is the same as everybody else's. Because if you do, it's not a competitive advantage. And finally, you need to be able to communicate it. There's no point in having something you can't explain. That's what a com competitive advantage is. 
And every winning business I can think of has one. And there's an example. <laughs> this is an outstanding brand. This is the third biggest retailer on the, the third biggest bricks and mortar retailer on the planet. Uh, it is an amazing product, an amazing store, an amazing concept, an amazing focus on bringing well-designed product at an economical price to a specific market. It does it better than anybody's ever done it. Tell me somebody who comes close, even if you, like me, hate it. Tell me somebody who comes close to IKEA. Tell me somebody who's executed competitive advantage better than, than IKEA. These guys are good. Another one I'd argue is Uber. You know, Uber, people think their competitive advantage is their, is their GPS or the fact that they use your phone or all of these kind of things. You know, competitive advantage is they're not a taxi service. You know, you don't have to put up with a grumpy person taking your booking. You don't have to put up with somebody saying, we'll be there next available. You know, somebody putting up there saying, we'll be there in 20 minutes and then turns up in three hours. You don't have to put up the fact you can't make a booking with any accuracy. You don't have to put up with a dirty car. You don't put up with all of these things. Their competitive advantage is whether they're not a taxi service. They're privately owned vehicles that provide a personal service. They have a real competitive advantage. And my view is that taxis will never be. Because taxis think it's about the cost of the fare. Does anybody here think that using Uber is about the cost of the fare? Does anybody use Uber because it's cheaper? I think a lot of people do. I've never used one, but I, a lot of my students... You think they use it because it's cheaper? They do. They use it's cheaper. That's right. what they do it for. But right. that's, uh, they're the younger ones. I don't know what old they are. But I think you'll find... Well, it certainly cost is an issue. Yeah. But it's not the issue. It's inconvenient. You know, I pick up my phone and ring them and it says we'll be there in five minutes. They're there in five minutes and if they're not, they, they say I'm nearly there. I'm running late for a meeting. I call Swan Taxis. You know, what's going to happen? These guys know exactly who they are. These people, I don't know who they are. Um, I can't see the difference between most of the products. They're all the same. There's no competitive advantage. One venue is the same as the next venue, the same as the next venue. Parking in some is better than others. Other than that, you know, there is no competitor. Nobody sat down and thought about it. what is it that is that core reason why somebody would come to us rather than someone else. They think, oh, you know, we'll be nicer to them. We offer better service. Nobody believes it and it's not true. What is that core thing that sets you apart? And central to that is making the product do the heavy, heavy lifting. Kenley hates me saying this, I say it all the time. The heart and soul of great marketing is the product. That's what your competitive advantage is built on, but it is about the product. This is one of my favourite brands in the world. 1300, I, I don't like shopping there. I don't like their, their product as in the stuff they sell. I like their product as in Zara. Um, and I like the business. They've got about 1,400 retail stores around the world. Um, they cater for a middle market. They are vertically integrated. They are an exceptional business. Um, they're a retailer. So give me a tip. What do you think their advertising budget is as a percentage of turnover? It's pretty big. Guess. The average for a retailer is 8%. Mm -hmm. What do you think theirs is? Well, they've never had an advertising budget. Zero. They've never had an advertising budget. Really? They've never had an advertising budget. Zara are in the top 10 retailers in the world and they do not advertise at all, except for Star. What they do is they develop an extraordinary it's all about the product. They survey and monitor their market over and over and over and over again. And they give their market not what they want the market to have. They give the market what the market wants to have. The, uh, they are completely obsessed with their customer. They can describe their customer to the last, 
the last little bit. They know exactly who they're selling to. They know exactly what you, what you wear. They know exactly how often you shop. They know exactly how often you spend. They know you better than you know yourself. And they tailor the product to just that. It is all about the product. It's not about the promotion. This one. I won't go to the same, to the same drama again. But that is now the largest motor car company by market capitalization now, Tesla. Mm -hmm. And they are the 13th largest car manufacturer by number of vehicles produced now. So they have an advertising budget of zero. And if you speak to Elon Musk, who is chairman, he'll tell you, if you've got a good product, you don't need to advertise it. You just don't need to. Because every cent you invest in the product is about 20, 20 cents you won't have to invest in promoting. Develop a great product. And a great product is one that understands exactly who the market is and tailors the product to that market. How about this one? We all know what that is. No advertising budget. Biggest, biggest retail confectionery group in the world. No advertising budget. It's all about the sugar. It's all about that sugar here. And people love it and they keep on buying it. But they know what their punters want. They know exactly what their punters want. They don't keep saying, buy me, buy me, buy me, buy me. They develop a product. I was going to say a great product. It's a disgusting product. <laughs> but, it's a, but, it's, but it's a product that people love to eat. And I've only ever had two Krispy Kremes in my life. The first one and then the second one straight away, you know. <laughs> because that's what it's like. The sugar gets in your system, you want lots more of this. It's a wonderful example of good marketing. So about this competitive advantage, understand your core competencies. Understand what you're good at. Have a look at your business and say, what am I really, really good at? Second point, understand what the market segments are and as much as you can about them. No market is homogeneous. Different segments are looking for different things. And because somebody else is making a killing in one segment, doesn't mean you should. It may well mean that you shouldn't. It may well mean that you should go after another segment. Let them make a killing in their segment. Third point, identify the segment you want to own. So don't go after the market. Go after the segment you want to own. And the sharper that segment is, the more time you can devote to understanding and developing a really, really good understanding. Understand your customers' problems. People think that marketing is about identifying needs and wants. No, it's not. Marketing is about identifying problems. You're in the business of solving problems. The best marketers on the planet develop products that solve problems. What problems are your consumers having now? Your target market. Are they having problems booking? Are they having problems finding parking? Are they, what problems are they having? If you go and ask people, Steve Jobs once said, don't ever do focus groups because people don't know what they want. He's 100% right. And I used to do a lot of focus groups. Because people don't know what they want. But they do know what their problems are. You don't ask them what they want. You ask them what their problems are. So when you're finished with, 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 with your customers, when they're about to leave, ask them what went right and what went wrong. Because that's what you can do something about. When you want to find a market, identify a market and ask the people what problems are you having. One of my greatest stories, one of the greatest products of my lifetime, I think, is a Dyson vacuum cleaner. Yeah. I mean, there are very few things more obnoxious than vacuum cleaner. <laughs> except, um, a trip to Ikea. <laughs> and, except a trip to Ikea. Except a trip to Ikea. And James Dyson, Lord James Dyson, mm. he wasn't just James then, mm. Jimmy's uh, was, was sitting on his couch watching his wife vacuum cleaning, which every respectable bloke should do. And she was vacuuming, and he noticed, you know, under the thing and over the thing and her, you know, and he said, this is a horrible experience. So he got a pad out and he wrote down all the problems that she was having. You know, she, the, the curtain sticks to the vacuum cleaner, you know, the, the cord gets in the way. When, and he developed a product, his engineer, that eliminated those problems. That's all he did. He looked at all the problems and eliminated them. And when he developed the new vacuum cleaner, he gave it to her and sat down and had a watch. And uh, he noticed there were other problems she was having now. He solved some problems and he created some new ones. And 
So, write those down and develop a vacuum cleaner. The 